we're going to get started in just a moment. Hi, welcome everyone. Um, today I'm here at Seacliff State Beach. I am Pravina, and I'm here to teach you about this really special California State Park. You might have noticed in the beginning of the live stream that we have that really large concrete ship at the end of the pier, and we're going to get to learn all about that um, and the role it plays in the ecosystem today and why it's important to leave it there. So we're going to give it maybe another 30 seconds to see if the viewers are going to join. All right, so let's get started. We're going to talk all about that ship. It's known as the SS Palo Alto, that big, sunken, broken concrete ship out there was built actually up in Oakland, California, and it was built for World War I. Unfortunately, it was finished just after World War I had ended, um, so it never actually saw any action. And why was it built on concrete? Well, because the iron and steel were scarce during that time, so concrete was a widely available option for them to use to build the ship from. It's actually over 6,000 tons, which is massive, and I have a photo here of it being built. So you can see how large it is compared to all of those people. So it never actually saw any action, like I said. It was docked up in Oakland for about 10 years until an entertainment company from Nevada purchased it, and they purchased it with the intention of um, taking it up and down the coast here for excursions. It was that idea never really caught on and they found this beach that allowed them to sink it here and they sunk it right out there, built the long pier out and they filled the ship with a casino, a cafe, a ballroom, um, some carnival games and my personal favorite, a 54 foot heated pool. And this entertainment area was used for a few years until the Great Depression hit and the company went bankrupt. And when the company went bankrupt around that time, there was a big storm that came through and actually like broke the ship in half um, and rendered it a bit unusable for <laughs> all of this entertainment. And they sold it to the state of California for one dollar, which is pretty, pretty low. <laughs> Um, and the state of California allowed people to go out and fish off of the boat and people would just go walk around and see what kind of life was out there. And then passed and more storms came and heavy seas and they broke the ship even more. Um, and so now people can't go out onto the boat just because it's completely broken and turned around <laughs> and a bit sunken. But you can actually walk out the pier about halfway down and look out from the pier and look at the ocean and look down. It's really nice. Um, so why do we leave this huge broken concrete ship out there? Well, it turns out it makes a really great habitat for a lot of animals. And if you look above here, let me see if I can flip this around. How do I do that? All right, flip it around. If you look closely, you can see all of the seabirds kind of rested on top. A lot of those are cormorants, but there's also seagulls flying around and they'll go and perch out on that ship. And even at low tide, we'll get a lot of seals that like to rest on that ship um, when they kind of just hop on uh, where the tide meets the, the, the ship. So yeah, seals will rest on there, cormorants, seagulls, and even pelicans when they're around. Um, but that's not the only life that uses the ship. What's really, really cool is that if you go underwater and you look at um, into the ship, it actually creates this really cool artificial reef. And what is an artificial reef? It's a reef that is man-made, um, and it's like it can be old ships or concrete slabs that humans have left out in the ocean. Um, and this allows other animals to come and attach to the concrete. The concrete makes a really good substrate for animals to attach to. So animals like um, sea anemones and a lot of seaweed and algae can attach to this concrete and grow off of it. 
And this creates a really complex habitat. So no, no longer is it just concrete, but it's also seaweed that's coming off and anemones. And this creates a lot of layers for animals to hide in. And it also creates more food for other animals to eat. So there's a lot of animals that actually live underwater on that ship, and it's very biodiverse, especially compared to the ocean around it. So if you look, if you go scuba diving, you look around the boat, maybe next to it, it's just like a sandy flat bottom, which isn't very complex. So a lot of animals don't live in that sandy bottom. And so the, the ship is a really great place for animals to come to and, and live their lives. Um, and we have a lot of invertebrates that live on the ship, the ship. So there's like fish, but there's also animals that don't have a backbone. And this includes crabs and sea urchins and sea stars. And my personal favorite, um, nudibranchs, which are also known as sea slugs. And they're super cute. I'll show you a picture later. Um, yeah, so there's all these cool algae and invertebrates living on this ship, as well as like little fish that can hide in the seaweed. Um, and barnacles and mussels and tons of great animals. So we're gonna dive on in and look at some other animals that I have here in our tank that we can actually find on the ship out there. So I'm gonna turn you around and we'll have a look at our tank. So this is our tank here at Seacliff State Beach Visitor Center. You are all welcome to come check it out when we reopen. We have a sea star, some red algae, it's a better view of it. Um, we have this really large anemone, and we have some teeny tiny anemones, these pink ones. Um, we've got a sea urchin in there, we've got a few of those, and we do have a hermit crab somewhere in here. So, oh, and there's other sea stars back there in the filter. So we'll start with talking about what creates this really great habitat on the concrete ship. We have all this red algae here. It's very dense and that there's a lot of opportunity for animals to hide in this algae. And this is what creates that complex habitat that animals can live in on the concrete ship. So it's not just concrete, but it has all of this algae coming off and growing off of it. You can see that it's just attached to these rocks right here. And yeah, the algae is growing off. Um, this is great food for a lot of animals that we'll get to talk about. And that red algae is not the only type. If you look closely here, you can see that pink coralline algae, and that's an encrusting algae. So it actually leaves, leaves this calcium carbonate structure on the rock, and that creates a really great base um, for animals. And that's just another type of algae. So let's start off with our giant green anemone that we have right here. If you find these out in the wild, a lot of these animals you can actually find out tide pooling. So they're really, really um, hardy animals that live in this zone called the intertidal zone. And this intertidal zone is basically where when the high tide comes up, they're submerged. But when the tide goes down and it's a low tide, if it's low enough, um, it might leave, leave these um, animals exposed to the air and the sun and the heat. So these animals have to be very resistant to these various changes in their habitat. Um, one way that this green anemone, this giant green anemone adapts to that, um, they have this really cool adaptation that you can see closely, if you look closely right here um, at the kind of like the stalk of the anemone, you can see that it has this sand grains and these little rocks and these shells that are attached to it. Now if you're out in a tide pool you might be able to see that it's actually covered even more in all of this sandy rocky substrate. And scientists basically think that this helps protect it when the tide is low. It helps protect it from heat and sunlight and air exposure so it really helps it retain moisture which is important for the sea anemone sur to survive. And you can see that it's also got a greenish tint. The ones that you find out in the um, tide pools are actually a bit of maybe a deeper green color. And this green color actually comes from a really cool symbiotic relationship it has with this algae called zooxanthellae. And it's this little algae that lives in the tissue of the anemone and it photosynthesizes. 
This can help provide the anemone with energy and oxygen, and the anemone provides this algae with protection from predators, as well as access to sunlight. Um, so, and this is what gives the anemone its greenish tint and its greenish color, which is very cool. It also has these really long tentacles that you might have noticed um, around, and those actually contain these really tiny sting, stinging cells known as nematocysts, and it's basically, if you imagine, like a little harpoon coiled up into a little cell. If something triggers it, like a fish um, that the tentacle touches, it will shoot out this little harpoon and it can paralyze the fish or whatever it's trying to feed on. Um, and these tentacles can then bring it towards its mouth, which you can see is that hole right in the middle. And that is how anemones eat. So that hole in the middle is where the anemones feed from, and it's also where they excrete their waste. And let's move on. That's the giant green anemone that we have here. And we have two um, sunburst anemones right in the sides of this tank. And those have very similar adaptations. And here we have little strawberry anemones. And these you can generally find in little clusters. And a lot of them are kind of clones of each other. And these are usually a lot smaller than the giant green anemones that we find. They too have the stinging cells. So what's next? Let's see, let's look at our sea urchins. So we have a few in this tank right now. There's one, this is the purple sea urchin. One very obvious adaptation that these guys have are those spines around the outside. And those spines help the urchin stay protected from predators like fish, um, and also the adorable sea otters. And you can see that it's actually got a shell attached, the shell that it's like kind of suction cup to its body. This one also has another seashell. This can just help it with more protection um, from predators. And the way they actually hold this shell to its body, and also how it moves, is that it has these things called tube feet. Sea stars have very similar tube feet. Let's go to this tank right over here. You might be able to see it better. There we go. Hmm, there's a bit of glare. So those tube feet that you can see it moving. There we go. You can see those tube feet swaying in the, in the water current. Those actually help it move around, and it's actually got them all over its body. And that big shell that you see, that kind of is the body of the sea urchin, um, that's called the test. So those two feet are all around the test of the sea urchin, and they not only help it move, but they can also help it move food towards its mouth, which as you see is right on the bottom right here. That white dot, you see, oh, you can kind of see the little teeth-like um, projections moving. That's known as its Aristotle lantern. And we've actually cleaned one of our sea urchins here. It recently passed away. Um, so we have this clean sea urchin right over here. And here you can see the test, which is the shell of the sea urchin. It's got little holes. Have you noticed those little holes? And that helps water flow in and flow out for its gills. Um, and this is where the mouth would be. It's this larger hole in the bottom. And here is the Aristotle's lantern, which is very awesome. So these five um, tooth-like plates kind of come out from underneath. So they come out from this hole right here. Um, and this black tip is what we were seeing on that sea urchin in the tank. And this is known as Aristotle's lantern. And it's got these five plates. So not only does this help it feed, but sea urchins can actually dig into rocks as well. So if you go tide pooling, you might see that these sea urchins have dug their own little hole out in this rock. And that just keeps the sea urchin protected from predators. Um, and sometimes, so they'll come out to feed, they'll crawl out to feed and eat, 
and then retreat back to their hold. But if they dug their hole out and they're in their hole for too long while they're growing, sometimes these sea urchins can actually get stuck um, and they rely on food passing over them for them to be able to feed because they can't leave their hole. A cool fact about, well not sea urchins, but the sea otters that eat these sea urchins, if sea otters rely on sea urchins for food, like completely rely on sea urchins or have a really heavily sea urchin, sea urchin diet, um, their teeth and bones can actually turn a bit purple. I would like to have some purple bones from sea urchins. <laughs> um, great, so we're gonna move on to our bat star. And that's this big sea star right here. We've got a few of these in the tank. We'll have a look around. So this one's a pink color. This one's got a bit of a purplish tint. This one's a bit of a lighter pink. Um, and these sea stars um, can actually range in a variety of colors. They can be from red to orange and yellow, even green and purple. The ones we have here are generally a bit pinker though. So, oh, our hermit crab friend is right here as well. So let's go back to the sea star. So we see that it also has some two feet. Do you see those two feet kind of coming out the sides of the feet or the legs, the arms right here? <laughs> These are their two feet and similar to the sea urchins, they also are water powered. So sea stars and sea urchins will have water flowing to their body, through their body and they have a water vascular system which allows these two feet to move and then crawl around and they're like little feelers. Also at the end of the sea star arms, they have eye spots. Now they don't have eyes like us, they can't really see shapes, but they do see light and dark. So if something, if a predator kind of passes over them, it allows them to go hide. Now, my favorite fact about sea stars is that when they're feeding, they actually expel their stomach so that it leaves their mouth and surrounds whatever they're eating. And it starts to digest the, its food and its prey on the outside of its body. And once it's partially digested, it'll then bring it into the stomach inside of the body. That's wild. Very unusual. Also, you might have noticed this fuzziness on the outside of the sea star. Those are very, those are similar to gills and they kind of help it um, breathe and exchange gases so that they can absorb more oxygen. Also in particular to bat stars is that you can see that in comparison to our other sea stars, the big ochre stars in the back, um, these bat stars are actually, they have a bit of a web. They kind of look like they're a little bit webbed right here. And their skin um, extends out. And so these worms called polychaete worms can live under there and feed off of whatever leftovers the sea star leaves for them. So there can be like up to 20 polychaete worms inside of the sea star. Well, not quite inside, but just living under the, the skin flap or like in the arm grooves there. It's like a little micro habitat. All right, let's go on to our little hermit crab who's come out to say hi. You can see there that its eyes are sticking out and that it's got claws. So hermit crabs are decapods, which means they have 10 feet or 10 legs. So deca means 10, pod means foot, um, and they've got 10 of those. So they've actually got two that live inside of the shell and that help it stay attached to the shell. And it's got the others sticking out front. So five pairs. And they have those long antennae sticking out to help them feel around. And you can see that it's cleaning off its antenna. Hermit crabs are really important to the ecosystem along with sea stars because they feed on um, decomposing matter and it helps with the decomposition process in our oceans. All right, let's have another look at that big sea urchin there. And that's 
going to be all for today, folks. Let me see if I can clip you back in here. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, I hope everyone is staying safe and well at home. Sea Cliff is open for day use, so you are welcome to come down and walk around. Just keep that six foot of social distancing space between um, you and your friends and come enjoy the warm weather <laughs> that's finally picked up. I'm gonna leave it on the ocean for the next five minutes so you guys continue to stay in peace and watch the waves hit the ocean. Sorry, if it hit the sand. <laughs> there we go. Thank you all for tuning in and hope to see you next time.